Man, did you know that 90% of the world's millionaires have a substantial holding in real estate? What does that mean to you? Bottom line is if you're not investing in real estate, then you're behind the eight ball and you're certainly not on a path to creating riches, especially not in real estate. But don't worry, I'm here to help. My name is Jerome D. Love and I have a substantial holdings in real estate. I know how to build houses, I've managed tenants. So my personal experience over the last 25 years is here to benefit you and that's why I created this five part masterclass. Now in today's lesson, we're gonna talk about writing the lease, which is ultimately what helps you to manage the tenant. You see, in any relationship, you have to establish the rules. And as a landlord, you have the power, you get to set the rules. So if your tenants don't pay you on time or they don't pay your late fees, it's because you haven't established the rules. So I'm gonna give you some of my tips and tools for writing the lease, some of the various language and disclosures that I put in to protect myself and to make sure that my stress level stays down and my cash flow keeps coming in. So before we get into today's lesson, make sure you subscribe, make sure you share, make sure you like, and if you want a personal consultation call, there's a link in the description below. So click that link. And until then, enjoy today's lesson. Hi, this is Jerome D. Love, and I want to welcome you to the Black Money Tree Masterclass managing the property. The Black Money Tree is a wealth development system that's designed to help you build wealth so that you can build your community. I am so excited about this outreach and this initiative because I believe that it's so necessary. When you look at the state of the black community, there are so many negative statistics, but there's so much that can be done that we can do on our own to build our own communities but if we're going to build our own communities, if we're going to control our own destinies, we have to have the resources to do so. And that's what the Black Money Tree is about, helping you to build wealth so that you can then help someone else. Now, the Black Money Tree has two basic principles that it's founded upon, or two primary focuses, let me say, that we focus on in terms of wealth building. That's entrepreneurship, and then it's also real estate investing. Now, we chose those two for two basic reasons. Number one, I would say I'm somewhat of an expert in both areas. I've been in real estate and an entrepreneur for almost 25 years now. Got my real estate license when I was in college and have been doing it ever since. From every aspect, I've helped people to buy homes, I've helped people to sell homes, I've built homes, I've remodeled homes from other people, I've remodeled homes for myself, I've managed properties for my portfolio of houses and my company as well. So I've done real estate from A to Z, I've developed land, I've done all kinds of stuff in terms of real estate. And then I'm also, in that same respect, from an entrepreneurial perspective, I started my first business when I was 19 in college. I've sold t-shirts, I've written books, I've done speaking engagements. I mean, the, the, the list goes on. I run a nonprofit, Texas Black Expo is a nonprofit organization. So I know what it takes to build a business as well. And then the second reason why we chose to those two factors is when you look at the wealth in this country, most of your millionaires, your, your billionaires from Tilman Fertitta, he's an entrepreneur, but he also has a whole bunch of real estate, right? You look at any of the wealthy folk in this country, they have businesses and they own real estate. I'm very passionate about real estate because real estate has changed my life. And I want to, you to learn from my experiences. I've lost a lot of money. I've made a lot of mistakes. But through those mistakes, I've learned ways to create wealth in real estate. And I'm going to teach you how I make my money in real estate. Now, remember, if you haven't seen the first masterclass, go to BeARealEstateInvestor.com. It's free. Understand the methodology. The reason I say that, when I tell people that I'm in real estate, most of the time people say, oh, you flip houses. When I tell them I'm investing, I don't flip houses. I believe in keeping properties long-term, long-term rental properties. That's what I do. But there's a reason for why I do that. And of course, I go to it in detail on the first masterclass on real estate investing. But just know that your strategy and your methodology may be tweaked, it may change a little bit based upon your particular needs. 
my strategy was based upon my needs. So today we're going to be talking about managing the property. Once again, the black money tree between believes in buying properties, rehabbing those properties and renting them for long-term profit. We believe that that's the most profitable way to increase your net worth and to create streams of income, which then frees you up so then you could be more active and engaged in your community, whether that be your family, whether it be nonprofits, your church, whatever it is, you need to have the autonomy to be free to help and build your community. So when we talk about managing your properties, we're gonna talk about how to find the right tenants and structure the lease in such a way that's going to minimize your stress levels, okay? Because at the end of the day, we're trying to improve our quality of life, right? So the things that I'm doing is based upon the fact that I'm married, I have four kids, and I have several businesses. So I'm trying to reduce my stress level. My dad, I remember when he retired, I'd be like, Dad, you got all this money. You need to start buying some houses, this, that, and the other. And he was like, boy, I done worked all my life. I ain't ready to go buy no doggone house. I ain't trying to deal with no tenants. So for him, he was kind of like, hey, I'll give you some money and you invest, do what you got to do, and then just break me off a little bit and give me my money back later. But I ain't trying to buy no house. So that was because of where he was at in his life. I'm at a different place in my life. I'm on the grind. I got four kids. My daughter's going to be in college next year. And then a year after that, my second daughter. Then a year after that, I got three back to back to back college tuitions I got to pay. And not to mention my son, which will be three, which will be three years after them. So that's my motivation. That's why I do what I do. If your variables are different, maybe your strategy is a little bit different. But I assure you, if you're starting out or if you already have some real estate, the principles that I'm going to share, the, our system, the strategies will help you. I will also suggest you go to theblackmoneytree.com. The book, Closing the Wealth Gap, goes in detail on all the information we're going to share today. So with that said, let's get to it. Let's talk about uh, managing your properties. We're going to go over four primary things. Fair housing guidelines, how to find the right tenant, the two most important criteria of a tenant, and key components of a lease agreement. Okay, so fair housing. The main thing I want to say here is you cannot discriminate on people. Back in the 60s, you know what they did. Black people live over here. White people live over here. White people can get loans. Black people can't get loans. If you're Jewish, you live over here. If you're Christian, you live over here. You can't do that type of stuff anymore. You can't look at a tenant and say, hey, you have four kids. I don't want you in my house but this is a single couple, I want them in my house. Those are violations. Now, this information that I have here is based upon the state of Texas, the protected classes of race, religion, national origin, color, familiar status, disability, and sex. So you can't discriminate on people that are renting your house. You have to have basic standard guidelines that you utilize to allow people in um, your property that can't be based upon any of these things. That's the main thing there. Now, pause real quick before I get to the other part of this. Let's talk a little bit about setting your rent. The rent is very important because that's what's going to attract the tenant, but that's also what's going to help you make some money, all right? So when you're setting your rent, you want to review the comparables. Look at the area, look at the neighborhood, see what other people are renting their properties for. Just know you don't operate in a vacuum. If someone's looking at your house, they're looking at the house next door and on the street over and on the next street. So if your house is two, three hundred dollars higher, you're probably not going to rent it. So always make sure you look at the comparables, but also understand that ultimately your pricing strategy is based upon your strategic goals. Now, part of what I'm going to say here, and I say this at every master class, there's more than one way to skin a cat. The common notion and ideology in real estate investing is you get the tenant in and you start bumping their rent up, bumping their rent up, bumping their rent up, bumping their rent up, and that's how you make your money. I personally do not buy into that philosophy. The way I feel like it's best to make money in this game is to keep your money flowing as long as possible uninterrupted. So with that said, my strategy is not to bump the tenant's rent up. Now, I will bump the tenants rent up sometime, but that's not necessarily my strategy. Now, if you listen to any of the other masterclasses, I talk about how we 
rehab our houses. So when we rehab our houses, it's pretty much a brand new house when we're done. So for me, even if the market says the rent is a thousand, I may shoot for 1100 because I know in a lot of these lower income areas, a lot of the properties aren't going to be as good a condition as mine and the landlords aren't going to take care of them as well. So mine's going to show better. It's going to look better. And it's only one time to get that new home rent. So I'm going to try to get a little bit higher, but just know the higher your rent is, the shorter the term that the tenant tends to live there, the higher the rent, they're going to start looking for something else. Now, perhaps that's what you want. I prefer long-term tenants in my property because I want my money flowing as long as possible uninterrupted. Now, once that first tenant is in and then they're out, now I may adjust my rent to be closer to the market and sometimes a little bit below the market because I want my property rented quickly. Now, let's pause right here. Let's talk about raising the rent. Now, let's think about that. I've, I've talked to uh, several people and they said, no, oh, man, you got to raise your rent. You got to raise your rent. That's where you make the money. You got to keep up with inflation. And I get that. I understand that. But let's do some quick numbers here. Let's say that I have a tenant that's paying me $1,000 a month. They've been with me for three years, always pay their rent on time. So that means I'm making $12,000 a year off of that tenant. If I want to raise their rent $100, that means that I'm going to make another $1,200, right? Easy, man. Why wouldn't you do it? Well, the reason I wouldn't do it, because if I raise their rent $100 and they decide they're going to move across the street, now I have an empty property where I lose $1,000 one month. Plus, I have to spend $1,000 to paint it, get it ready to go, and then bring in another tenant. So in order to make $1,200, I'm going to have to spend $2,000. Does that math work? That doesn't compute to me. So for me, I'm gonna, if, if it's a good tenant, they're paying their rent, I'm going to leave them alone. Now, if it's a bad tenant, they pay their rent, always late, um, trash and debris, complaints from the neighbors, I'm going to get every dime from that tenant. So I'm going to raise that rent. And if they leave, I really don't care. But if they pay it, then that's a little extra money. That's just the way I look at it. Now, that being said, if I have a good tenant, the market rate is $1,200, their rent is 1000 I may go 1050 maybe 1075 But I'm going to keep it below the market because I want to keep them in there. Because having a good tenant is a premium for me. That's my strategy. Your strategy may be different, but that's what I suggest. Because ultimately, you want to keep that money flowing as long as possible uninterrupted. So, now, how do you find your tenant? There are four primary ways of finding a tenant. Now, these are the ways that we've used. You can put a yard sign. You can go to the MLS or get a realtor or other internet listings. So like your Zillow, your Trulia and things of that nature. And then also word of mouth. Now the yard sign, I've used those in the past. I really don't use them anymore. I am a realtor, so I have access to the MLS. So most of the times I put my properties on the MLS. What I found, I used to do a lot of Craigslist as well. But what I found is when you put it on the MLS, you tend to get a better grade of tenant. If you put it on Craigslist, you have people that don't have realtors because the realtors know that they are a, let's just say a special case. So they're not working with them. So they out looking on their own. But when you put it on the MLS, I have found that you have a higher grade of, of tenant. Now in the Houston area, that tends to be sufficient. Now, but if your market is a little bit slower, maybe you put it on the MLS, maybe you put it on Craigslist, and maybe you put a yard sign. But for me, it's pretty much, I'm finding it sufficient just to put it on the MLS. But those are four of the primary areas that you can uh, put list your property. Now, when you show the property, just dress professionally. Most of the time, we in the hood. That's what we suggest. Go in the inner cities, lower income communities. You got to go in and you got to look the part. The reality is you go in, you're a certain race, they're a certain race. Many times, oh, you the owner? You know, I, I can't stand when the tenants ask me that question. First thing they say, oh, are you the realtor or are you the owner? I.e., am I going to be able to get the hookup? 
you know, I don't like that question. So I just say, hey, I'm the realtor. But make sure you dress professionally, specifically if you're not a realtor and you're the owner short on your own. Let them know that you mean business, you're not their cousin, and they ain't about to get the hookup, okay? Also, be prompt. Make sure you're on time. Be professional, all right? Set one to two showing times a day. Now, my main point is here. When I started out, it was all new to me. I put it on Craigslist. I'd be in my office at 12 o'clock. My phone ring at 12.05. Hey, man, I like this house. I'm excited. Okay, I'll be there in 30 minutes. I show up at 12.30, they go. Or next thing you know, oh, well, it's for my cousin. It's for my auntie and da 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 So I found myself running back and forth all the time. So I say, okay, let's cut this out. A lot of uh, the tenants that I work with, a lot of these areas, they're working overnight. They're stockers. They have blue-collar jobs. So what I started doing was the showing time in the morning, maybe 8, 9 o'clock, and the showing time in the evening, 6.30, 7 o'clock. What that also does, I found, is it creates competition. If you say the showing is at 6 o'clock and eight people show up, then people are like, oh, man, other people want this house. I need to stop playing around and I need to go and get it. So that's what's worked for me. Sometimes that can backfire, and I've had people say, well, all these other people want it. I'm probably not going to get it. But by and large, that's what I have found to be a success. And then lastly, safety first. There are a lot of crazies out there. If you're going to be showing properties, make sure specifically if you're a female, let someone know where you're going. Let somebody know who you're meeting to make sure that you're safe. Now, one of the most important criteria when looking for a property. Now, this is the way I do it, okay? Your demographic, your market may be a little bit different. My number one kind of criteria is capacity to repay. How much money do you make? Do you have a job? If the rent is a thousand, I want to see three thousand dollars a month in gross income, not net gross income. Now, this is just kind of standard in the industry, and I find that it works. And then also rental history. Where have you rented in the past, and have you paid your rent on the hat on time? Because basically. The past is the greatest indicator of what's going to happen in the future. If you lived in five different places in five different years, chances are mine is going to be six. So I know that my goal is to keep you in there four or five years. So you're probably not going to be the right fit for me. Now, if I don't have anything else going on, maybe that doesn't matter to me. I also will call the landlord and I'll ask, hey, did they pay their rent on time? Hey. Did they keep the property up? I'll ask those types of questions. But so those are the two primary criteria. Now, notice I did not say uh, criminal background and I did not say credit. Now, let me just pause right here to talk a little bit about why I'm passionate about this and why the black money tree exists. We know the historical uh, racism that's been in this country. We know that there are so many of our black men that have cases. Most of the times when I lease properties, it's typically to a female. And why is that? Because they don't want to write their boyfriend on there because he got caught up on a weed charge or something like this. I have a friend I went to high school with. He had flunked. By the time we were a junior, I believe he was 18. He was dating a young lady who was a sophomore who I believe was 15. The mother was okay with it. They broke up. She's mad at him. Mother decides to get, get back to him and file charges against him for statutory rape. He from the hood. He don't have a lawyer. He ain't got no money. He ends up accepting a plea deal, and he is now a registered sex offender. Now, I'm not saying that I am looking for sex offenders to be in my property. But I'm saying I understand historically there are a lot of our people that are in positions where they have felonies and they have things on their record, and sometimes it shouldn't have been there. And I believe that God has blessed me to be in a position to have properties, to have resources, to be able to give some people a chance to help people out. Another quick story, I had a guy call me once. He said, hey, man, I'm going to be straight up with you. I caught a dope case, and I'm living with my mom. He's not my ideal tenant. He has no real history, and he told me he had a dope case. But he told me straight up, I'm trying to get my life together. I let him rent my property. He was there seven years, one of my best tenants. He was late sometimes, but he would always call me, Mr. Love, I'm going to have you on the 8th. I'm going to have you on the 10th. 
and he would always pay on time. So, and now from my understanding, he's looking at buying the house. We've developed a relationship. He's been to my house for 4th of July. He's been to my house for Christmas. We built a relationship. So I feel like I was able to help that young man. And ultimately the black money tree is about helping you to build wealth so that we can build our communities. So now what if, what if that guy couldn't rent from me? You know, his life may be on a different path, but I feel like that I was able to help that young man. And that's what this is really about. So historically also, we know most of our folk have not been taught sound principles when it comes to money management and financial literacy. So for me, it's a given when a tenant comes to my property that they have bad credit. Now, criminal background, credit, I will use that as a tiebreaker. If I have two tenants, they have solid incomes, they have really good rental history, one of them has a criminal background, the other one doesn't, I may go with the one without the criminal background history as a tiebreaker or the one with the better credit as a tiebreaker. But for me, those are not the primary criteria. And that strategy has worked for me. I've been doing this over 11 years now in terms of the investment side. That works for me. You can choose what works best for you and your environment. But I want to just basically, ultimately, this is not just about living large and putting money in your pocket. It's about helping other people. And we know the racism that this country has perpetuated against us. And we also know that if we don't give our people a chance, nobody else is. Now, that's all I got to say on that. So now let's talk about structuring the lease. There are seven basic areas you need to be concerned with. The term, the deposit, place of payment, time of payment, type of payment, repair request and deductible, and mediation language. So term. Basically, what I want to share here is I like long term. Some people don't like that. If your business model is to increase rent, then you want short leases so you can increase the rent. Me, I try to do a two year lease minimum because I want to make my money. I want to keep my money flowing. If your business model is to increase the rent, you may not agree with that, but I want long term leases because I want that money flowing for as long as possible uninterrupted. So I want a long term lease. That's the point here. Next deposit. One of the beauties of real estate is you can hedge yourself. Hedging just means protecting yourself. So the deposit, I've had so many people say, well, what if the tenant don't pay rent? Well, guess what? I got their deposit. What if the tenant tear the property up? Well, I got their deposit. You know, there's a book called The Grunge of uh, Giants. I'm, uh, it's called The Grunge of Giants by R. Bucky Fullminster. And he talks about how the wealthy elites of the world and our society create the laws and create the rules, and they create them in such a way where it protects their interests. Well, guess what? When you write this lease, you're the giant. You control that property and you can write the laws in such a way where it protects your interest. So you put that deposit up so that you can ensure your interests are protected. Let's talk about, I had a guy, I told you I took a chance on the one guy and he turned it out well. I had another guy who came to me, everything in me said don't rent to him, but he said, man, I really need a property. I make $1,500 every week. Uh, and I need some help. And he, he didn't have a stable rental background. Nothing in him said that he was good. But cash flow was a little bit low and nobody else was really beating down my door. So I say, okay, give me first and last month's rent as a deposit and, you know, first month's rent before you move in. So in order to say the deposit was, uh, uh, the rent was $1,000, that meant he had to give me $3,000 before he moved in. And that's what he did. He moved in, and just as I suspected, about three, four months down the line, I, I went to collect rent. He wasn't there. The house was empty. So, but at the end of the day, I had $3,000 up front. It was an annoyance. It was a frustration. But guess what? Painted it, got it ready to go, and rented it to another person. So deposits are very important because it help, helps you to hedge yourself and protect yourself. Now, in terms of payment. You got to think about the place, time, and type. So when I started out, tenants would call me. It was kind of an ego stroke. Oh, man, I'm ready to go pick up my rent. And that's cool when you have one, maybe two, maybe three properties. But when you start growing, when you start scaling, you don't have time to be going back and forth to these properties and you get there. Well, yeah, my cousin about to take me to the store. So I, can, I, I, I don't have time for that. Now we have a central place. 
they know the rent is due on the first, it's late on the third. So that's the time that they have to pay. So they have to go drop their rent off. And if it's not there, they impose the late fee. And then type of payment. Main thing here, don't take cash. Early on, I used to pick up cash. I'd be driving from house to house and I had three, four thousand dollars in my pocket. That's not a very wise idea being in the hood with three, four thousand dollars in your pocket. Now, cashiers, checks, money orders, Zelle. That's pretty much all we take. You can do cash out or whatever it is that you do, but don't accept checks. Let me just tell you that too. Because you know, sometimes people within these lower income communities, they'll give you the check, believing that the money's gonna come in tomorrow. And that can just cause a lot of headaches. So don't accept checks, don't accept cash. Um, and whatever the electronic methods you use, that's up to you. I knew a realtor that used to allow the tenants to deposit the money into her bank account. I've never done that, but you may want to do that as well. Now repairs, all requests must be in writing as well as a repair deductible must be paid before we go out. The main thing here is understand that some tenants believe that they're not getting their money's worth if they don't see you out there once or twice a month fixing on something. They don't understand that they're paying for a place to live. So I always make them put it in writing because that's going to decrease the chances that they actually call me out. And I also make them pay a repair deductible, which is 1% of their rent. Why? Because that also hedges me. I also tell them if, you know, I tell them, Hey, if you, uh, your toilet's running and you want me to jiggle the handle, your rent's a thousand dollars, you're going to pay me a hundred dollars to jiggle the handle. But also if your toilet is backed up and water's flowing all over the place and it's a $2,000 repair, you know, you pay me a hundred dollars. My goal isn't to deter you from calling me, but which will happen sometimes. So do know if there's a hundred dollar repair deductible, some tenants aren't going to call you. They're going to try to do stuff themselves and it can cause some issues. But for me, the way my life is set up, I'm trying to minimize those calls. So I try to empower them to take care of little things on their own. Also, I rehab my properties. They're in good condition when they move in. So if anything is breaking, it's nine times out of 10, it's because they broke it. All right. So before we get to our last point, I want to share one quick message. Did you know that 30% of people who set goals will actually accomplish those goals? The reason I'm sharing that, you've watched more than 70% of this program, which means that you're head and shoulders above the average. And I know you're serious about building your wealth in real estate. But the truth of the matter is, while there's a lot of good information that I'm providing, nothing compares to being able to pick up the phone and call someone that's been there, done that, and is willing to help you through the process. So for a limited time only, I'm going to allow you to book a consulting call with me. There's a link in the description that you can book a call with me one hour and I'll walk you through whatever it is you need. I'll answer whatever questions you have, which I believe is irreplaceable. When I started my business, I had a mentor. He helped me with whatever I need and I wanted to be able to do the same for you. Also, get the book, Closing the Wealth Gap. This has so much more information and detail information that I'm not able to go through to this course, but you can get it on Amazon. There's also a link in the bio or in the description below. And if you're in the Houston area, check out our own uh, on site, um, on location prospecting. You can book me. I'll come out. I'll assess your house. I'll help you meet with the contractors. So many resources that I think would be necessary that will help you in building wealth in real estate. Now, lastly, you may be feeling a little overwhelmed and you may say growing my wealth in real estate may be kind of far fetched, but that's normal. I want you to check out this message from one of my top mentees, Mr. Odnaje Barnes. He started out with me. He started out with one single family house and he's now on his third apartment complex. Check out his story and then we'll be right on to the next point. The one conversation I remember is we was talking about buying a house and I was saying, every time I have a kid, I'm going to buy a house and that's yeah. going to be my college fund. Yeah. You said, man, that's the same way, you know. Yeah, and, yeah. And, I, that, that, that that's was kind exactly of my how I started. Process. Yeah. I mean, that literally was my mindset. But literally, we started from the, just a simple aspect of, one, we used our first home. As, yep. is, as an investment property. If you buy right up front, right? Yep. And real estate 101 is yep. we make our money when we, yep. when when we you buy, buy right? Yep. That's real yep. estate 101, right? And so for me, 
I wanted to use that same mentality on yeah. our first house, um, which, which we did. I got a great loan yeah. on that first house. I uh, remember. I was, yeah. I was your realtor. I, I remember I, somebody I remember was that. my yeah, realtor. Yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. So we did buy a foreclosure, got a good deal on it, uh, put some sweat equity into it, yeah. put some, uh, con- you know, we put some money into yeah. it. It was listed for one eighty. Uh, my my pretty good dope realtor. Uh, uh, he, he was able to negotiate 135 and I put about 35 into it. So I'm like yeah. all in for like yeah. 160, 165, somewhere around there. And within like six months, we had a 240, uh, uh appraisal, $240,000 appraisal. So I got wow. that cash out early and, uh, you were like, Hey, you know, um, I got these deals. I got, you know, maybe she'll sell you four of them. I'm like, okay, I, I looked at four or five of them and I was like, okay, I want a couple of these, I want a couple of these or whatever. And I'm like, man, what can I get them for? He's like, well, you can't get into them. I was like, well, man, I can't walk them into the property. He's like yeah. I can't, I can't pay full price. He's like, all right, cool. We'll figure it out. Blah, blah. So, um, we got those houses for 16,500 uh-huh. each. Yeah. So it was two of them. Uh, but long story short, uh, I'm renting them for thirteen fifty now. Wow! Right, uh, and that's probably still under market. Yeah. So I'm renting them for thirteen fifty. Uh, I did do a cash out refi because I'm a burst strategy guy. So I yeah. did a cash out refi about three years ago. Got pulled a hundred grand from both of them. Whoa! Pulled a hundred <laughs> grand from both of them. So so to bring it a little bit home, that twenty one unit complex that you toured, I bought that with the two hundred grand from the two deals. And lastly, mediation. I don't have time to be going back and forth to court dealing with lawyers. So in our leases, we make sure we write a mediation clause that basically says if there's a dispute before we sue each other, we'll go to a mediator and we'll split the cost and then we'll go with the uh, ruling of that mediator. Now, I'm not an attorney, I'm not a CPA. So in your area, your county, the laws, the rules may be a little bit different. So make sure you consult with an attorney Make sure you consult with a CPA, but this is what has worked for us and I hope it will work for you as well. Okay, so now we know how to structure that lease in such a way that you can manage the tenant in an effective manner. But now guess what? You need to have a solid business plan. So in the next masterclass, it's all about writing the business plan. A business plan is kind of like a roadmap. It navigates you to the trajectory or the path that you want to get to. We all want to get to wealth and riches and real estate and having multiple properties, but you got to have a plan to get there. And that's what the next class is all about. So before you go, make sure you like, make sure you subscribe and share the wealth. Let somebody else know about the Black Money Tree movement. And if you want a personal consultation, I'll sit down with you talk through your business plan, help to evaluate properties, just click the link in the description.